sometime around the second century AD, an apologetic letter was sent to a man named Diognetus. He had questions about Christianity, and so a, a believer wrote him describing different things about the Christian faith and specifically the way believers live. One section of it is a part I want to read to you because I think it so much matches with what we're studying in the book of 1 Peter. He says this, Christians are indistinguishable from other men either by nationality, language, or customs. They do not inhabit separate cities of their own or speak a strange dialect or follow some outlandish way of life. Their teaching is not based on, upon reveries inspired by the curiosity of men. Unlike some other people, they champion no purely human doctrine. With regard to dress, food, and manner of life in general, they follow the same customs of whatever city they happen to be living in, whether it is Greek or foreign. And yet there is something extraordinary about their lives. They live in their own countries as though they were only passing through. They play their full role as citizens, but labor under all the disabilities of aliens. Any country can be their homeland, but for them their homeland, wherever it may be, is a foreign country. Like others, they marry and have children, but they do not expose them. They share their meals, but not their wives. They live in the flesh, but they are not governed by the desires of the flesh. They pass their days upon earth, but they are citizens of heaven. Obedient to the laws, they yet live on a level that transcends the law. Christians love all men, but all men persecute them. Condemned because they are not understood, they are put to death, but raised to life again. They live in poverty, but enrich many. They are totally destitute, but possess an, um, an abundance of everything. They suffer dishonor, but that is their glory. They are defamed, but vindicated. A blessing is their answer to abuse, deference their response to insult. For the good they do, they receive the punishment of malefactors, but even then they rejoice as though receiving the gift of life. They are attacked by the Jews as aliens. They are persecuted by the Greeks, yet no one can explain the reason for this hatred. To speak in general terms, we may say that the Christian is to the world what the soul is to the body. As the soul is present in every part of the body while remaining distinct from it, so Christians are found in all the cities of the world but cannot be identified with the world. As the visible body contains the invisible soul, so Christians are seen living in the world, but their religious life remains unseen. The body hates the soul and warns against it, not because of any injury the soul has done it, but because of the restriction the soul plays on its pleasures. Similarly, the world hates the Christians, not because they've done it any wrong, but because they are opposed to its enjoyments. Christians love those who hate them just as the soul loves the body and all its members despite the body's hatred. It is by the soul enclosed within the body that the body is held together, and similarly it is by the Christians detained in the world as in a prison that the world is held together. The soul, though immortal, has a mortal dwelling place, and Christians also live for a time amidst perishable things while awaiting the freedom from change and decay that will be theirs in heaven. As the soul benefits from the deprivation of food and drink, so Christians flourish under persecution. Such is the Christian's lofty and divinely appointed function from which he is not permitted to excuse himself. Wow. That's a description of the church in the first couple centuries. Is that impressive? I think the, the Apostle Peter would have said, Amen. Thank you for understanding what I wrote. Brothers and sisters, we are the family of God. Amen? Amen. And as such, we are foreigners 
We are strangers, we are aliens here, and yet we have a mission to accomplish. And it is our privilege to stand up and stand out. And that's what I believe Peter's main message is, as we've looked at that a couple of weeks ago, that he is calling us as believers to stand up for Jesus, to be counted as true followers of his. But don't just say it, live it. We stand up and say, yes, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, but I am also willing to stand out and be different than those around me. And I don't care if you think I'm strange or weird or you think I'm foolish, I am going to follow the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I'm gonna do what he says and I'm gonna please him with my life because I live for an audience of one. I do not fear man, I fear the Lord. Amen? That's what we're supposed to be and that's what Peter writes for. He writes that to people who are being severely persecuted. They're suffering because they're believers and we've not experienced much of that in our country but if we did, we might be prone to back down a little bit. We might not want to go poke the bear. We might want to just kind of ease into the woodwork and be, what would I call them, a Clairol Christian? <laughs> Where only their hairdresser knows for sure. You know what I'm talking about? We have a privilege of representing Jesus, but it's hard. And Peter is an idealist, but he's also a realist. He encourages the believer to stand up and stand out, but he also recognizes it's tough. And that's why we need encouragement. It's not easy going out into the world and being different, especially when we are called all kinds of names and falsely accused. So he writes to that end. And in the book lays out simply, chapter one, verses one through 12, lays the foundation and then chapter 1, verse 13, through the end of the book is the exhortation. He tells you who you are in Christ and the resources that are yours, and then says, because of that, now here's a series of commands. These are the things that you need to do, 25, 35 different commands of us, what we're supposed to go out and do and be in the world. Those exhortations are our response to so great a salvation with sanctification, submission, suffering, and service. Now we've looked so far at the first part of this foundation of salvation. In verses one and two, we said that heaven was given to us. It's a gift, it comes from heaven. We did nothing to earn it or deserve it. Are you thankful for that? And so this gift comes to us, but it didn't just come to us. We didn't just receive a gift, it's a guaranteed gift. Even though we're waiting to be there someday, even though it's far off perhaps and we're hoping it's not, even though that's true, it's guaranteed. From the moment of salvation, you know 100% for sure that you are going to go to heaven. And so heaven is given and heaven is guaranteed. And Peter, I believe by doing that, is trying to turn their worry into worship. Anybody here ever struggle with worry? You know what I have found when worry and anxiety, when fear, when trouble, when struggles come, one of the greatest things I can do is to worship. There's something about worship that lifts me out of the doldrums, it lifts me out of the miry clay and brings me back up to a place where, okay God, you are on the throne, you can handle this. I'll cast all my cares upon you because I know you care. And his shoulders are broad enough to take them. This is what he's trying to do. In verse three, he says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed means praiseworthy. God, because you've given me this gift of salvation and because I know it's a guaranteed gift, I wanna praise you, I wanna honor you, I wanna worship you. And frankly, one commentator pointed out that verses three through 12 in the Greek text is one sentence. One ongoing run on. Peter can't stop. Once he starts writing this, he just keeps going and going and going and adds all these different components and there's commas and semicolons and all of this stuff because he can't contain all of these different details about what it would mean if we truly worship the living God. 
and said thank you for so great a salvation. John Newton, the fa- man who famously wrote what him? Amazing Grace. He was a uh, slave trader who then came to Saving Face and was so dramatically changed, he became a pastor. He was visiting a family in his church whose house had burned to the ground. And he walks in and he says to the wife, I give you joy, madam. (laughs) Right after her house burned down. She said, joy that all my property is consumed? He replied, no, joy that you have so much property that no fire can ever touch. Heaven, guaranteed. Does that make you want to worship? Oh God, thank you for this heavenly gift. And even when I'm suffering, if I know that heaven is given to me and heaven is guaranteed, it lifts my spirit and it causes me to usher out heavenly worship. And that's the third point here in verses six through nine. No matter how severe our circumstances may ever be, we can still rejoice in the Lord. How often? Always. And again, I say, rejoice. rejoice. We can rejoice always, give thanks always, and pray without ceasing because God is sovereign all the time. And Peter then launches into this section about worship because of what Jesus has done. And this is heavenly worship. This is not bound by the problems of this life, not limited by the suffering we're experiencing. Look in verse six. In this you what? What kind of rejoice? greatly rejoice. We're going to see what that means in a moment. Even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with what? Joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. He starts off by saying, in this, in what? What he had just been talking about, and there's been a lot of debate about that, I'll just simplify it. I believe he's talking about in this salvation, This entire package of salvation that was given to you and guaranteed for you. This gift that you have received that can never be taken away. In this, you greatly rejoice. Now, Peter is an optimist and he is celebrating, he's exciting, he's worshiping, but he's also a realist. And what follows in these interesting verses, six, seven, eight, and nine, is a series of twos. And these twos are positive and negative because he's a realist. There's two great practices followed by two big problems, followed by two big promises, followed by two even bigger promises. And that's what he does here in this text to motivate the people to keep worshiping the Lord no matter what they're going through. So let's take a look at this together. I'm going to break the outline down that way. First, two great practices. Notice what he says in verse 6. You, what kind of rejoice? Greatly rejoice. The Greek word there is an interesting word. It's not the normal word. The normal Greek word is Cairo. And you might hear that word. There's a famous city in Egypt that means to rejoice. The early church, when they gathered together, you know what their greeting was? Kairite. What does that mean? It was an imperative telling everybody they met to rejoice. When the early church gathered, they would say to one another, rejoice. And the other one would go, you rejoice. No, you rejoice. 
There was this sense of being so thrilled and so grateful for what God had done. And even the thrill of gathering together as believers after being out in the world, they just wanted to rejoice in Jesus. But this is another Greek word. It means to be supremely and abundantly happy or to be overjoyed. You have a joy that's not just kind of like when some people say, are, are you happy to be a Christian? Oh, yes, brother. <laughs> uh-huh. They sound more like Eeyore than Tigger. And Christians ought to be Tigger. We ought to just have joy flowing out of us abundantly. And this word even implies it has an outward manifestation. It's not just that the joy is inside of you. It's that this joy can't be contained. It's flowing out of you. You see it in your face. You hear it in your tone of voice. You see it, there's a skip in your step. You are excited about anything and everything that comes your way because you know God's in control. So you greatly rejoice. It's not tentative. It's not based on circumstances. It's not superficial feelings. It flows out of a guaranteed eternal relationship with God that nothing can ever change. And when I know that's true, I'm overwhelmed by joy. It's also a present tense word, meaning this is the ongoing habit of life. This isn't just something that happens once in a while when you're at a concert or you're in a church service and they finally sing a song that you like. This is something that is a way of life. You are just a rejoicing person. You are constantly expressing joy even in the midst of suffering. That's what he's talking about. Now, I can imagine Peter reflecting on the words of Jesus in Matthew 5, verses 10 through 12. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Then he says this, rejoice and, the next word, be glad. Same Greek word. For your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus said, when you are persecuted, when you are hated, when you are maligned because you're a follower of him, you ought to just jump up and shout for joy because that means there's a reward coming. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 and 13, Peter uses the same word there. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you, but to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, I love this, keep on rejoicing, so that also with the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exultation. Hey, no matter how bad it gets, he said back here in the first chapter, rejoice greatly, and then he says three chapters later in chapter four, he says, keep it up, no matter what, no matter how difficult the trial, no matter how bad it gets, let the practice of your life be to be rejoicing. Could you imagine what that would do to our neighbors? If they just saw you and you're just outside always singing, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. I mean, you just, you can't stop it. You're out there going, I got the joy, joy, joy. You know, you imagine that? No, you can't. Okay, well, I'd like you to, to think about how your joy could cause people to go, tell me, what are you so excited about? What is going on? How come you're always happy? I know you have the same problems I do. I know you've got a car that you just had to take to the thing. I know that you've got a tough job. I know that your kids is not healthy right now. I know you're facing all the same things I do. How is it that you're smiling? And then what a privilege we have to tell them of the hope that's within us. Amen? So I want to encourage you. This word here, one commentator said, greatly rejoice has the connotation of leap for joy. It's like the Toyota commercial, right? And you're just running around going, oh, 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 what a feeling. You can't contain it. You are just jumping and leaping and praising God. It's like Psalm 150. And when you worship the Lord, you want loud instruments and resounding cymbals and your hands lifted in praise because you're so overwhelmed with joy. 
at what God has done for you that no man can take from you. That's what Peter is saying. This ought to be one of the great practices of those who understand their salvation. Now, I might say this. That is not something a person will do if they think they can lose their salvation. This is what people do when they realize it's guaranteed. Nothing can take this away. I will rejoice for all eternity. I might as well get warmed up now. But that leads to a second great practice that's a lot like the first one. In verse 8, he says, you greatly rejoice. He repeats that, but here he adds, with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Now, the word inexpressible means inexpressible. It means that it's, the literal, literal word is higher than speech. In other words, there are no words. I have a joy that is so overwhelming, there aren't even words that can express it. There is nothing written in the human language that can describe what God has done for me. You just get beyond, and there's this transcendent joy that nobody has ever been able to find the words to fully describe. It's like Romans 8, 26. That same word there, inexpressible, is used of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit intercedes for you, It says, with groanings that are what? Too deep for words. That's the same Greek word. The Spirit is interceding on our behalf, and He is praying at such a level. There's no words in the English language that can fully express how He prays for you. And Peter says, that's what your joy ought to be like when you understand salvation. He says it's inexpressible and it's full of glory or it's glorious. It's a a glorious joy. It's the kind we're going to express in heaven. Can you imagine what it's going to be like in heaven? In fact, I think there's a song with something like that in the title. I can only imagine. Think about these words. Surrounded by your glory. What will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or what? In awe of you be still. Will I stand in your presence or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I what? Be able to speak at all. That's what Peter's describing. These practices that ought to be the common way we live, even in the midst of trials. And might I say, if we did that in the midst of trials and suffering, those things would grow strangely dim, wouldn't they? In the light of his glory and grace. If we were worshipers, which is what God seeks, I think it's fascinating. In the Bible, there's only two things that it says God seeks. One, he came to seek and to save that which was what? Lost. And he seeks worshipers who will worship him in spirit and in truth. That's what God is seeking. And we have the privilege of responding to so great a salvation with worship. God, I can't even express how grateful I am. There are no words, but I'm jumping for joy. And I want you to receive the praise and the glory and the honor you deserve. I, I want to I learn how to worship you here like I will someday in heaven. Well, that's what we do when we understand the guaranteed gift of salvation. But Peter now also is a realist. And so he follows the two great practices with two big problems. Two big problems. The first one in verse six is trials. (laughs) I love this. After describing what he just said, he goes, even though, don't you love those words? Have you ever gone to the doctor and they do a full test on you, run a bunch of exams, and then they, they look at you and they go, you know what, you're in pretty good health. 
however, you're like, oh no, what does that mean? And it's the however that creates tension in your life. You know, that scan looks pretty good, however. It says, even though you are distressed, Peter's a realist. That word means you're saddened, you're sorrowful, you're painful, you're heavy, you have grief. It refers to physical pain as well as mental anguish. Is that real in this world? So many disappointments, so many struggles. In fact, even Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane in Matthew 26, 37 and following, it says that as he went to pray, he was grieved. It's the same word. Can you imagine that? <clears throat> he was so distressed, he was sweating what? Blood out of his face. That's distress. We don't think about our Lord that way, do we? Experiencing and about to experience the wrath of God for us. He was distressed. You say, well, but, but the apostles never experienced that, right? Yeah, they did. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, the apostle Paul says, we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength so that we despaired even of life. You know what word is a good definition of what he just said? This is a, a, an idiom or a phrase. It would be as if Paul said, I want you to know that I was a basket case. The apostle Paul? Yeah. Yeah. That's the real world, isn't it? Sometimes we go through real trials that are very intense and very painful, and we are grieved by them, and they seem overwhelming. But Peter is saying, guess what, folks? At the exact same time that is happening, you can also experience rejoicing. See, that, that's an oxymoron. That's like a jumbo shrimp. Yeah, I know. It's weird, but it's true. You can be hurting and rejoicing at the same time. He says, even though you're distressed by various trials, there's such a variety of trials. There are many colored. And when someone comes up and says to you, I know exactly what you're going through, you say, no, you might have an idea, but you don't know exactly. Because this trial is like a multicolored garment, like, like what uh, Joseph received from his father. It's, it's just different. And, and your trial is similar, but it's different. And in fact, the same word is used later in the first Peter in chapter 4, when he talks about how we have these multicolored spiritual gifts. Everybody has a spiritual gift that's like a snowflake. You might have the gift of teaching and someone else has the gift of teaching. Is it exactly the same? No. And that's what he's saying here. You're going to go through trials. Have you ever gone through a trial and you go, man, I'm sure glad I got through that one. I'll never have to go through that again. I learned. Really? Well, you went through the trial at level one. And about two years later, God comes back at level three. And you're like, oh man, I thought I'd overcome that. And whoo! And then next three years later, it's level five. You know what I'm saying? There are multicolored trials that come of you. And Paul, the realist, says, I know that you're going through that. And you're going through the trial. The word is either test or temptation. It's the same word. It just depends on the context. If God is doing this, it's a test. If the world, the flesh, and the devil is thrown at you, it's a what? It's a temptation. God wants you to pass the test, succeed, the devil wants you to fail. Same time, same thing. God brings tests into our lives. What does the devil want you to do? He wants you to fail and be discouraged and to have doubt. God wants you to succeed, as we're going to see in a moment, and get stronger. So the first big problem is our faith being tested in painful ways. The second is that we currently must walk by faith, not sight. Look at verse 8. 
though you have not seen him. Who's the him? Jesus. Peter's writing to people who are 30 plus years removed from the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus ascended to heaven. He had not come back yet. We're still waiting for him to come back. So this is a large group of people who never had the privilege of seeing Jesus in person. But Peter had. Peter was an eyewitness. They were not. And it made me think about doubting Thomas. You remember in John chapter 20, Jesus had risen from the dead and he appeared to the disciples. But the first time he appeared, Thomas wasn't there. And so then while they're all gathered again and Thomas was with them and they're all telling Thomas, hey, we saw the Lord. And he's going, I won't believe it until I see the, the holes here and the hole in it. I'm going to stick my finger in it. I, I want proof. And then Jesus appears in the room. Go ahead, Thomas. Check it out if you need to. And Thomas says, my Lord and my Okay, Thomas, you got it. He says, you believe because you saw? Blessed are those who don't see and yet what? Guess what? That's us. That's us. Here we are 2,000 years later, those who believe but have never seen. Have you ever talked to somebody in our culture who says, you know, I, I would believe in Jesus if he appeared in front of me. If, if he just came, I would believe. You go, no, you wouldn't. Nope, the vast majority rejected him when they saw him. They saw the miracles, they heard the teaching, they recognized the authority, and they still rejected him. No, that's no guarantee that seeing him, but the miracle of salvation has occurred and we believe even though we don't see. But guess what? When you are in the midst of a really, really tough trial, it's hard. You know what I'm talking about? It's very, very hard. And you're going, Jesus, are you there? This has been going on for months now. Jesus, I, I, I've been praying about this for years now. Are you there? I can't see you. I can't feel you. And he says, one of the painful problems is when you have to walk by faith, not by sight. There's a little bit of relief when he says, though you do not see him now, in verse 8. What's the implication of that? You will. There's a day coming and you will. What's the test? Will you continue to walk by faith no matter what? That's the point we talked about Wednesday night in our leadership training class of 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that no temptation has overtaken you, but such is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the, with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, that you may be able to endure it. Not escape it, endure it, stay under it. What is the point of that whole passage? The illustration of the children of Israel in the wilderness, who when God was nice and good and everything was provided for them, they followed him joyfully, but, but the moment it got hard, they turned to idolatry, they turned to immorality, they stopped walking by faith. And Paul writes to the Corinthians and says, you don't have to do that. You can keep on keeping on. You can keep on trusting Jesus even if you don't see him. Even if it's hard. God will always provide for you to keep trusting him. What is the temptation here then? It's to trust something else. Trust something that I can see. You know, I'm having financial problems and it and if I just cheated on this business deal, I would make plenty of money to pay for my family's needs. So God will understand, right? No. God wants you to keep trusting Him, not your own devices. He wants you to be faithful and let Him provide. You know what I'm talking about? Is this hard? This is the real world. And Peter says, I know you've got these problems. I know this is tough. 
So two great practices of rejoicing are so very practical when you're facing these two big problems. And now the realist Peter becomes an optimist again and he encourages them with two big promises. In verse six, he says, now for a little while, if necessary. And then he talks about these trials. I love that. There's two critical things in here that are so practical and so encouraging. The first one is that trials are passing. Trials are temporary. He says, now for a, how long? A little while. Now there's a problem with that because with the Lord, a day is as a what? Thousand years. Oh my. What does a little while mean? Trials only last a little while. Well, that's a relative term. That little while may be a few seconds, it may be a few hours, it may be a few days, maybe a few weeks, it may be a few years, it may be a lifetime. But Peter's point is it's only a little while. And we need to have that perspective. Some trials are quick. You know what I'm talking about. Anybody here ever drive on the freeway? Raise your hand if you've ever driven on the freeway. Do you ever have any temptations or trials on the freeway? No? And you're just always just rejoicing. Oh, thank you for almost hitting me. Bless you. Some trials are over quick. The person cuts you off and then you never see them again. Fine. Some trials last years, like Joseph, being betrayed by his brother, sold into slavery, being mistreated by Potiphar's wife and thrown in prison, and then being stuck in prison for years. Some trials last a lifetime, like our friend Johnny Erickson Tata. But compared to eternity, it's only a little while. Oh, we need that perspective. You know, you can endure almost anything if you know it's going to end, right? And there is going to be an end. And God will deliver. Romans 8, 18, I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to to be revealed to us. 2 Corinthians 4, 17, Paul writes, and I love this, he says, for momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison." You say, what's that going to be like someday when we are with the Lord? There's an incredible description in Revelation chapter 7 of tribulation saints who are martyred and they're now in heaven. And in verse 15 says, For this reason they are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tabernacle over them. They will hunger no longer, nor thirst any more, nor will the sun beat down on them, nor any heat. For the lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd and will guide them to springs of the water of life, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Trials are passing even if it leads to our martyrdom, it'll be over quickly. And then we have how long? All eternity. There was a little boy who fell down the stairs when he was small and was paralyzed the rest of his life. At age 17, he went to church and he shared his story with the pastor who said, man, I'm so sorry, what a, what a horrific thing to have to go through. Are you, are you ever upset at God with that? He says, no. He says, I figure he's got all eternity to make up for it. <laughs> oh, the perspective. Trials are passing and secondly, trials are providential. They're purposeful. I love how Peter says, if necessary. The phrase is almost interesting in English because it literally means inevitable. (laughs) Trials are inevitable. They're going to happen. Why? Because God loves you. He loves you too much to let you stay the way you are. He wants you to grow and change. What Peter is saying is trials are always under God's control. Do you remember what happened with Job? 
What did Satan have to do? He had to go to God and what? Ask permission. You see that in Job chapter 1 and chapter 2, and God gave him limits. Okay, you can go this far, but not any further. Same thing happened in Luke chapter 22, verse 31, when, when Jesus told Peter, hey, Satan has sought permission to sift all of you like wheat. In other words, he had to ask first. Does that comfort you at all? What it tells me is the God who loves me, who foreknew me, who chose me, who adopted me, who sent his spirit to change me, that very God who is now my eternal father is orchestrating everything that happens in my life. There are no accidents. There are only appointments. God has appointed things for me to go experience, to endure for his glory by his grace. Why are they necessary? Let me give you just a few quick reasons. Number one, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 in the Apostle Paul's life, he needed to be humble. Boy, I need that one, don't you? I don't even have anything to be proud of and I find myself still being prideful. Oh, how God wants us to be humble. Why? Because he gives grace to the humble. So he brings trials in our lives that humble us, even humiliate us at time, to break us so that we'll depend on him and not ourselves. Sometimes Hebrews 12 says he has to chastise us. So we're going through a trial because he's given us a spanking because we've been wayward. We're not acting like his kids anymore. He's got to get our attention, going to get us back. Sometimes it's like James says in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, consider it all Joy when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. God wants you to be mature, Christ-like in every area of your life. Are you there yet? So he brings trials for that reason. By the way, I used to pray for patience, then I realized the only way you get patience is trials. I stopped praying about that one. And here's another one. I love this one. God brings trials in our lives to teach us things so we can turn around and help others. So he says in 2 Corinthians 1, I don't need to know why. Job never knew why. I don't need to know why. I just need to know he's in control. Think about it. The majority of people who are followers of Jesus today are followers because God brought difficulty into their life and got them to the end of their rope. And then they realized they needed a savior. I don't know about you, but I have grown the most in the deepest, darkest points of my history. How about you? Amen. Where God orchestrated me going through something where I lost it all. So I would learn he's all I need. Monumental changes in my life. Most people don't cling to the scriptures when things are going well, but they do under trial. And God doesn't apologize for trials. He takes full credit. Oh, that we would learn to rejoice and count it all joy encountering various trials, knowing that our loving Heavenly Father is using them for our good and His glory. Two great practices, two big problems, two big promises. We conclude with two bigger promises. Promises that take us from here and now to eternity, from suffering to salvation. These trials play an important role in our eternal future. And the first one is, in verse 7, trials prove our faith is genuine, leading ultimately to praise, glory, and honor. See what I mean? So that the proof of your faith being more precious than what? Gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, Peter uses the illustration of gold being refined by fire. How do you know if gold is real gold or if it's fool's gold? Well, if you throw it into a fire, you're going to find out real soon. How do you know if it's pure gold? You burn it at about 1,600 degrees. And when it melts and the dross comes to the top and you skim that dross away, now you have pure gold. And they said that the goldsmiths who would do that would know it was pure when they could look in it and see their face like in a mirror. Think about that analogy. God uses trials to remove the dross from our lives so that people will look at us 
and see what? Jesus. That we reflect his glory. We shine him forth. And he's saying this to people who have had their gold taken away because they're Christians. Think, that, think about that. Is gold valuable? I mean, I have a gold ring on here. It's a great reminder that I love my wife and she loves me. It's valuable. But you know what the streets are going to be made of in heaven? Hmm. What's more important? Jesus or pavement? Trials prove the genuineness of my faith. Paul Tripp said he calls this uncomfortable grace. When we're going through trials, we want God to give us the grace of release. And Paul Tripp says, no, he wants to give us the grace of refinement. God wants us to be proven. He wants it to be clear to the whole world that we truly are his children and trials bring that about. He says that it may be found a result in praise and glory and honor the revelation of Jesus Christ. Fascinating text. When you first read that, you would think, oh good, so if I pass the trial, then God will receive praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Well, that is true, but that's not what Peter is saying. Peter is saying if you pass these trials, you will receive praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Does that blow your mind? Jesus someday is going to say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. He's going to praise you. He's going to honor you. You are going to share in his glory. You are going to rule and reign with him. You are going to be a joint heir with Christ. All of that when he comes back. Oh, then whatever I got to go through between now and then, it's worth it. That's a big promise. Would you agree? Well, there's one more. Trials prove our love and faith is genuine and that we already have eternal salvation. He says in verse 8, you love him. Do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? Do you really love Jesus? How do we know? How is that proven? Remember when Peter was spoken to by the resurrected Savior? Peter, do you love me? And he used the Greek word that Peter uses here, agape. And Peter says, you know, I like you. That guy wrote to these suffering people and says, I know you love Jesus. Wow. Would that mean something? If the one who Jesus had to ask three times were to say, hey, I can tell you love Jesus. How do you know? Because you keep passing these trials. You keep getting through. You keep persevering. You're persecuted and you're suffering, but you keep going. Your love for Jesus is the mark of genuine salvation. And you believe into him, is what the Greek text says. You have a personal relationship with Jesus. You trust him exclusively. You don't trust in yourself. You don't trust in your religion. You trust in Christ alone. What does that result in? The salvation of your souls. This is the outcome. You obtain this. Well, what's fascinating here is, again, he uses a word that describes you are have already obtained it. Isn't that great? It's not that I will obtain salvation someday in the future, although I will. There's an element of salvation I will, but I have already obtained salvation. I am as saved as I'm going to be. How about you? Are you going to heaven? See, because the God who foreordained me, who foreknew me, who chose me, who justified me, is sanctifying me, and is glorifying me. Amen? And in Romans 8, he says it all in the past tense. In God's mind, it has already happened. So when I am going through these tests and I'm giving God glory and praise and honor, I already have salvation and it is proven. It is demonstrated and you can see it in my life. And boy, that tip, this makes me want to worship. How about you? I just want to sing more praises. I want to glorify God. I want to shout out. I want to have great rejoicing. I want to be in the Toyota commercial right? 
Because that's what happens when you have the gift of salvation and it's guaranteed. How about you? If you're here today, do you know that you know that you know that you have eternal life? Have you come to the place that you love Jesus more than life? You're so grateful for what he's done and you've invited him to come in to be your Lord and your Savior. That's where it starts. And if you have done that, are you persevering? Are you loving him and obeying him and trusting him more? Because that kind of worship is what will enable you to deal with suffering and persecution that certainly is coming. Amen? Father, thank you for these precious words of Peter. Thank you for speaking to us so clearly. I pray that if there's any here who have not yet bowed their knee before you, confessed their sin and invited Christ to come in and forgive them, that they would do that today. And I pray, Lord, for those who've already done that, that you would just fill us with your spirit and strengthen us in our innermost being, that we would rejoice even in the midst of suffering because you're in control and you've got a plan. You are going to bring about radical change in us to put your grace on display. And you are ultimately going to reassure us deep down inside we're already saved. Father, thank you for so great a salvation. Cause us to have heavenly praise that you so richly deserve. We ask in Jesus' name.